Good morning. Good morning. And the, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. And I'd like to invite my wife, Marcella, to join me. And because she, she is a medicine woman in her own right. And 2012 has so much to do with the return to the feminine. So we'd like to begin with a little bit of drumming, just to bring us into the space. The uh, traditions of the feminine are spatial traditions. They're not necessarily only technical, which is what I first wanted to learn when I went to the Amazon. What were the techniques? How do I do energy medicine? And one of the shamans said to me, Alberto, you have to heal yourself first. I said, good. He said, yeah, we have to heal your ignorance. <laughs> and I said, but I have a PhD. And he, he said, exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> Because for the shaman, there's, no dif there's a difference between information and wisdom. Information is knowing that water is H2O. Wisdom is being able to make it rain. Information is knowing a diagnosis. Wisdom is being able to heal. So we want to begin with a little bit of drumming to bring us all into the sacred space that, that Donna and David and all the other presenters have so beautifully created. And then we'll go into our presentation. David said, the, um, we're the only people in the world, the only culture who were cast out of the Garden of Eden. And what 2012 is about is about a return to Eden. Isn't that a great, uh, great? <laughs> and we explored other options as well, but <laughs> we needed a lot more equipment to be able to go back there. <laughs> this is one of our expeditions to Lake Titicaca. <laughs> but 2012 is what they call the Black Swan event, which is unprecedented. Nobody knows what it's about. It's fraught with opportunity. An example of that is the arrival of the white man in America. Changed everything, except the changes now are not external. The changes now are internal. And what the shamans say is that we don't know what's going to happen. We have a sense, but we can prepare for it. We can become the prophecies. We cannot just, we, we will not only become steeped in the information, we will become the prophecy, a new human that's being born. And I want to show you the steps for that that are so important today. And I last gave this presentation to a group of investment bankers, so the, uh, <laughs> I, but I like the material, so I left some of it in there. How many of you have automobile insurance, health insurance, renter's insurance, dental insurance? How about that umbrella insurance in case some of the other insurance? <laughs> <laughs> what about afterlife insurance? Who has that? <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's the one we want to really be looking at, the journey into infinity. And there were places like Machu Picchu, which were places of prophecy 
and divination, where they maintained and kept the traditions that first were born and germinated at the foothills of the Himalayas 50,000 years ago. This is a body of knowledge that goes back to the very beginning of time. And it was brought across the Bering Straits into the Americas as a complete body of wisdom, very ancient body of wisdom. The same body of wisdom that informed Tibetan Buddhism. Do you know that the very first Dalai Lama was appointed by a shaman? Dalai in Mongolian means the ocean, the ocean Lama, the great incarnation, appointed by Altan Khan, one of the Mongol leaders under the guidance of the shamans. A very ancient tradition. And this is another place in the Americas where the prophecies were read, where you were able to step outside of linear time and foretell the events to come and how to prepare for them. And they talked about the end of time. 2012 was the end of time, not the end of the world, not the end of humanity, but the end of time as we know it. The end of time and the dawning of a new time and of a new kind of time. And here are some of the shamans and the, see if we can get the sound to work as they are reading the prophecies. These are the wisdom keepers of the Andes, the medicine men and women that have been charged with the keeping and delivery of the prophecy. The coca is turned backwards. The coca says that we need to connect with the mother, connect with the earth. If we do not connect with our mother, that our mother will begin to lash out against us. The father above, the creator, is observing the creation and is not pleased. <sighs> So the prophecies, the Father above, you know, I was raised Catholic and thinking the old guy up there with the white beard, he said, no, 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 the Father above is the Son, the source of all life. Great upheavals happening in the Sun. How many of you have been following the plasma storms that are happening in the Sun, the reversal of the poles, the schedule for 2012 of the Sun? So this is where the codes for a new human are coming from. They're coming from the Sun. And through the sun, from the central sun in the universe. And we're going to look at what that means and how we can use those codes to upgrade the quality of our luminous energy field and grow new bodies that age and heal and die differently. But before we do that, we have to repair the brain. I'm glad that Candace was here yesterday and kind of broke the ice for some of the science. I'm going to take you through a very quick tour of the brain and how we need to repair the brain in order to become the prophecy. And we're going to look at uh, McLean's description of the triune brain. The brain is very, very complex. But we have a very simplified, anatomically correct version that I think you'll get immediately. Recent research indicates that the ironing particle is vastly exaggerated, but otherwise... So the, the brain, they say that if the brain were simple enough that we could understand it, that we would be so simple that we couldn't. <laughs> but we're going to look at four evolutionarily different brains that appeared over the last few million years of evolution. And to understand the unconscious programs that each one of these brains operates with. And how this is the dawning of a new brain as we come close to 2012. The first one is the reptilian brain, the brain stem, the most primitive brain that we share with the reptiles. And this brain responds to food and to pain. Anybody go to Catholic elementary school? Mother Mary Immaculata used to think that children learn best through pain. <laughs> I still have nightmares about her. But this is how this brain learns is through food and through pain. Some of you have been married to men that respond 
very well to this. This is because they were operating from that primitive, primitive brain, which has some really important functions, all of the autonomic functions, like breathing. Breathing is an autonomic function for us. We don't have to think about breathing. But dolphins don't have breathing programmed as an autonomic function in their brain. They have to consciously take every breath. Did you know that? <coughs> dolphin has to go, ah, oh, that was nice. I think I'll try another one. Which is why only half of its brain sleeps at any one time. So this is where all of our autonomic functions, heart rate, body temperature, respiration, and it has neural networks that are associated with survival. Very, very ancient, hardwired. The next is the mammalian brain. Sitting on top of the primitive reptilian brain is the brain that we share with the mammals. This is a fascinating brain because the survival instincts are encoded in the form of emotions. And it has four fundamental programs, which are fear, feeding, fighting, and fornicating. And the mammalian brain changes through ritual and ceremony. This is how this brain changes. Many of the rites, the ancient rites, were designed to help this brain evolve out of a mentality of scarcity, out of violence, out of fear. The, uh, and so most of the rites of passage that you find across different cultures, from marriage to puberty to death, are all it, to be able to free ourselves of the grip of this ancient brain that is still in the driver's seat today. And did you know that six of the Ten Commandments were designed to regulate this brain, to keep it under control? All of the thou shall not commandments are addressing this brain. And of course, in this brain is where the fight or flight response is, the HPA axis, where you live in fear or running away from, or in the resulting state, which is paralysis, where we're unable to respond. And when we get into that state, of course, we, we try to gorge. So the neural networks associated with this brain are survival and emotional neural networks. For the shaman, here's a very important point, it's impossible to heal the emotions. You cannot heal your emotions because they are ancient survival programs that are outdated, encoded in the form of emotions. You can have feelings, feelings are authentic, but all emotions are toxic. Feelings don't last for more than 20 minutes because the brain and nervous system resets itself every 20 minutes. So if it lasts longer than 20 minutes, it's not a feeling, it's not authentic. It's an old emotion that you learned from your parents that you picked up <clears throat> when you were in your mother's womb because stress hormones go through the placental barrier Feelings are authentic. If it lasts more than 20 minutes, it's an emotion. <laughs> Have you ever been angry at somebody for 20 minutes? Anybody? Come on, tell the truth. <laughs> How about 20 days? Anybody? <laughs> 20 years, anyone? <laughs> That's an emotion. <laughs> so if the phone rings and you look at the caller ID and you go, what the hell does he want? That's triggering emotions. So for the shaman, our healing process has to do with clearing all of our emotions. They are dated survival programs that keep us trapped in fear, in scarcity, in fighting, in violence. And what's the worst violence that we do? Ourselves. To ourselves, right. So if we want to help a client of ours break out of these patterns of living in scarcity, of living in a world that's not safe, of never having enough, I don't have enough money, enough time, enough, then we have to break out of the dictates of this ancient brain and tap into the new brain, the neocortex, the brain of Buddha, of Einstein. And this brain changes through bliss. This is how this brain changes, through enlightenment, through bliss. 
It's extraordinary. This is the brain of neuroplasticity. It loves ecstasy. It loves the experiences of oneness. And then it creates neural networks. Remembers that neurons that fire together, wire together. This is what neural networks are, information superhighways for discovery and creativity and transcendence and enlightenment. So the prophecies say that there's an, one of the ancient Mayan and Aztec prophecies that we would be going through 13 heavens of decreasing choice and then nine hells of increasing doom and then the Lord of the dawn would return. The end of the 13th heaven of increasing doom was when the conquistadors arrived in Mexico. They came with great white sails, ships coming from the east, and the Aztec scouts said, oh, it's the return of Quetzalcoatl, the Lord of the Dawn. Big mistake. It was the beginning of the nine hells of increasing doom. And then the Lord of the Dawn will return. The end of the ninth hell of increasing doom has just happened. <clears throat> so this marks the beginning of the return of that consciousness of this Buddha-like, Christ-like figure, the Lord of the Dawn, Quetzalcoatl, known to the Hopi, to the Mayan, to the Inca. And the question is, are we ready? Because the changes that are happening in 2012 as a result of this planetary alignment that we're experiencing that happens only once every 26,000 years, in which the sun, the earth, and the galactic center are perfectly aligned once every 26,000 years. And at the galactic center, the Mayans said, was a place known as Xibalba. Xibalba was the cosmic womb, it was the place where you could scream and nobody would hear you, where nothing could escape from, not even light. They said this 2,500 years ago. 40 years ago, we discovered that in the same place, at the very center of the galaxy, there was a black hole where nothing escapes from, not even light. This is the alignment that's happening December 21st, but we're feeling the ripples right now, aren't we? <laughs> Incredible how everything is on your plate at the same time, the beautiful, the terrible. <clears throat> a couple of years ago, I used to know a few people who were in crisis. Today, I know one or two people who are not in crisis. <laughs> so we've all heard the bad news about 2012 and the end of days, and our job today is really to spread the good news, to bring forth the good news, which is the dawn of a new human and a planetary initiation that we're going through, a great initiation that is happening at the level of the individual. <coughs> one of the prophecies is that during 2012, the differences between the inner world and the outer world will disappear. They will become one again. This is extraordinarily powerful because then every belief structure, every vision about the nature of reality that you hold internally, consciously or unconsciously, will manifest for you. It's already done so, <laughs> but with even greater intensity. What's propelling this are plasma storms coming from the sun during a time when the Earth's magnetosphere is at the thinnest that it has been in 2,000 years. The protective layer around the Earth has been decreasing in intensity. The electromagnetic field of the Earth is at about half a gauss when it normally is at about two gauss. And what that means is that we're becoming incredibly permeable to plasma storms coming from the sun. But these are the very same plasma storms that are bringing the downloads of a new human. And there are ways that you can get this download. You can get this download through the plants and animals that you eat because they get that from the sun directly. Or you can do what we do in the morning, which is to go outside and photosynthesize. 
Let the sun inform you directly. Every morning we make a juice, a green juice, because that's pure sunlight that we're drinking. And this, is, this has the codes for a new human that we have to feed to the body directly, the microRNAs that switch genes for health and longevity on. So the codes are being downloaded today. If you, how many of you take your vitamin D3? Absolutely essential. Take it. But go out in the sun. Because in 20 minutes, you synthesize about 20,000 units of D3. And you get the codes for the new human and for the new time that we're stepping into. So we're coming into attunement with galactic time. With galactic time. No longer with human time, but also with the deep biological time, with the time that is kept inside of ourselves by the feminine principle that we carry within us. The medicine men and women say that the feminine life force is collapsing, that this is the greatest crisis that the, that the planet is experiencing, is the collapse of this feminine life force that is bringing us close to the edge of extinction. I've been hearing this for many, many years, and then I began to take this to the laboratory and found that the feminine life force that the medicine men and women have been talking about was mitochondria. Remember mitochondria? The energy factories in your cell? All of us in this room do energy medicine. The source of fuel and energy in our body is mitochondria. And we'll talk a little bit more about mitochondria later, but it is the feminine life force because it is inherited only from your mother. So that at the moment of conception, remember the story about how we were conceived that we learn in biology where all the sperm were swimming really, really fast to get to that egg? It didn't work that way. That's not the way it worked. The way it really works is that there's this great, beautiful egg, and it's surrounded by all of these sperms, and it's going, you, I like you. <laughs> <laughs> Give me your DNA, but keep your mitochondria. Keep your mitochondria. So when you have genetic archaeologists tracing back the origins of a of a people, they will follow the mitochondrial line because they know it's going from daughter to mother to grandmother. This is the feminine life force. And we're going to learn a little bit later how we can restore it. But if you look at all the ancient temples in the Americas, they were temples to the earth, temples to the feminine, temples to the goddess, to the caretakers of the earth, to the feminine principle. In the jungle, the caretaker of the jungle is the female jaguar, mother-sister jaguar. We call her in the Amazon, mother-sister jaguar. Come to us. Protect this medicine space. Because the mother jaguar is a fierce protector of her babies. The male jaguar is doing really important stuff, you know. Comes around a couple of weeks a year to get laid. And then... <laughs> goes off to explore new territories, and, but it's the feminine principle that's the caretaker. So the prophecies speak about the <coughs> return of the caretakers of the earth, of the divine feminine, who has been represented in so many different ways, in so many different cultures. You have Kali, who's the goddess of time, the creator, the destroyer, the Paleolithic goddesses of Central Europe, and Aphrodite. Now, the story of Aphrodite is that she rises from the sea foam after Cronus cuts off Uranus's testicles, and they strike the waters. So, guys, this is a hint <laughs> that it's going to hurt. <laughs> this transition is not going to happen gently. And we're seeing it all around us. We're seeing the collapse of the old patriarchal masculine models. We're seeing it in medicine. We've come to the end of the masculine, invasive, antimicrobial, 
medicine, we're seeing it in economics, we're seeing it in every aspect of our lives. <clears throat> but what we have to do to embody this principle is to repair our brain. <laughs> and we can begin by repairing the brain and priming it for enlightenment. And in doing so, we're going to be able to receive these downloads that are coming in a way that they have not been available in more than 26,000 years. We have a short window. We have a year-long window to become a new species, a new species that will be us. Because biology says that evolution happens in between generations, that maybe your children will be smarter and handsomer than you are, but that it's too late for you. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Shamans say that evolution happens within generations. That we can take a quantum leap into who we are becoming 10,000 years from now. And if our ch children are lucky, maybe they will inherit some of the traits that we develop. We are the ones who are making that quantum leap. And it's happening today. And we're making that leap into the place of the goddess. And it's a rite of passage. It's not going to be quite as painful as Aphrodite had to go through because times are different. We have the internet today. But, the, uh, but it is going to be a tremendous transition. And I'm going to invite Marcella to come and share with us her thoughts of, and processes, and then we'll come back to the brain. Thank you, Alberto. And well, I learned so much about the Divine Feminine from Alberto. <laughs> because of course, as you know, the Divine Feminine lives, or it's in all of us, not just women. Uh, just as the masculine principle, it's within all of us, women and men. And where I come from in Chile, actually the Lord says that the men abused their power so only women are shamans there. And they are the machis, the medicine women. And actually, they're just maybe a 5% of men. And they call them double-spirited. In our culture, we call them gay. <laughs> gay people. They, they are medicine people as well. And they told me a song that they sing to invoke, to bring spirit to, to their ceremonies. And that's my passion, ceremony. And inside that passion of ceremony is my passion of rites of passage. And what we're going through in these times is a rite of passage. That means there is a, a death that we have to face. We all have to face a death of who we are not longer. So the, the new self can be birth. So if you don't mind, Alberto, would you drum for me? <clears throat> and I'm gonna confess you that I was the shyest girl in the whole school for many years. I had quantum leap in my life and that's why I teach this. So I'm gonna sing. Viene, viene bajando del cielo, viene, viene subiendo en la tierra, la fuerza de las raíces que va levantando nehuenes. I need more drumming, faster, <laughs> louder. Viene, viene bajando del cielo, viene, viene subiendo en la tierra, La fuerza de las raíces que va levantando nehuenes. Enséñame a mi ñañita a elevar mis rezos para el cielo. Eleva mi medicina, herencia de mis abuelos. Viene, viene bajando del cielo. Viene, viene subiendo en la tierra, 
la fuerza de las raíces que va levantando nehuenes. Enséñame a mi ñañita a elevar mis rezos para el cielo. Eleva mi medicina, herencia de mis abuelos. It's coming, coming, coming from the heavens. It's coming, coming, coming from deep within the earth. That force that's going to elevate my soul. Teach me, my sweet medicine sister, how to elevate my prayers. Teach me, my, my sweet medicine sister, how to ignite my medicine inherited from my grand, from my ancestors. So ceremony is to invite, spiritual ceremony has to do with inviting the divine, the sacred, to be with us. <clears throat> That's what makes a ceremony a ceremony. I invite spirit to be here. Mm. And rites of passage, as I was saying, it has to do with going through a death so there could be a rebirth. And then I feel that in our culture here, we are so afraid of death in the sense of going into the dark, going into the unknown, going into the unknown. And that is, that is the feminine, the unknown, the dark. And, and we're taught so much to do the opposite here, to always need to know what's going to happen next, to always have to fill the empty spaces. We're not taught to, to be comfortable with just emptiness, with just nothing, with just space, with that cosmic womb that Alberto was talking about, in which you have nothing to grasp, nothing familiar to grasp. And we are experiencing that because this is a rite of passage 2012. We, we are going into the dark so we can be... I, I like the image of, of being squeezed, like going into a tunnel and being squeezed on the other side, just like a baby that is going through the birth canal. It's that squeeze that's going to leave that old self behind and then and then see the light. And I like the image because when we're squeezed, is that everything that we no longer are, are just comes out of us. And, and we can just come out with our essential self, what we really are, with our luminous self. So my message here is that when we it's great to get together and dance and be happy and smile a lot and everything, but, but it's also great to honor um, that, that force that pulls you down, down deep into the earth and that is calling us also because what shamans say, sh the shamans that really know, where where would be the best place to hide wisdom? Wisdom that is so precious that we don't want to leave it out there endangered by the ones that have power. What is the best place where people are afraid, where people are afraid to go, where death resides? So we are afraid to go into the depths into, into where death is. And we want to escape, and we take all kinds of pills not to go there. Oh, I'm getting depressed, I better start taking pills. So where I come from, if you get depressed, it's because Mother Earth is calling you. It's calling you to come and retrieve the wisdom that was hidden there by the wisdom keepers 
thousands of years ago, where it would be safe. The wisdom for it to be safe was hidden, where people were afraid to go. So I practice, and I, I don't call it depressed. I, when I, I get that call to go down, I go down. And I experience darkness, and I experience nothing to grasp on, and I live, and, and I'm, I just breathe through the fear and through anything that comes up. And I'm going to tell you something. You always come out the other side, more wise, more beautiful, more powerful, more confident, with less fear, with no fear, because you faced your fear. So what I'm saying here is, it's not that I want you all to get depressed, <laughs> <laughs> but that if you feel that, there to experience that pull down. And that is actually also the return of the feminine, listening to our cycles. We are not supposed to have this steady contentment happiness. We, oh, I'm a happy person every day. We're not supposed to be like that. We, ha we are like the moon, like the sacred feminine. We have the full moon in which we're feeling outward, we're feeling happy, and, and we want to go share and be with friends and have a drink and be in a party and anything. But then we also have our, our no moon time, not even new moon, but no moon at all. Like that one day in which is complete darkness. We have that. So we need to, to learn to enjoy that as well to be in complete darkness and have nothing to grasp on and, and learn to be comfortable there. So <clears throat> I spent a lot of time there, actually, as a kid. I, I, was, I didn't belong to any religion. Nobody told me what's, what was going to happen after I died. And I was uh, taken to see a movie called A Day After. And, and it was a terrible movie about an atomic bomb. So that was the first time that I thought about death. I was nine years old. And I spent, I would imagine, about three months lying in my bed, just asking myself, what would happen when I die? And all I could see was black, dark, nothing, nothing to grasp on, no, no. So anyways, I became very familiar with that place, and now I feel very comfortable there with the Shivalba, the cosmic boom. And I now rest in that place when I'm called to go there, and I always come out happier out of that place for my full moon, for the full moon, for the full moon in me. So that is my message. Honor, all of, honor the cycles of life, of the feminine. Honor your full moon, honor your new moon, your, your no moon, and everything in between. So for the ladies that are still flowing once a month, call in sick. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and this is how we're going to change this paradigm that we live in of the masculine. And I love the masculine because it serves us. But this is a return of the feminine. So it's up to us women, so many of us here are women, to, to change the paradigm. We are the ones that raise the boys. So we need to start raising them in a different way if we want to change the world. We are the grandmothers of those boys. We got to teach our daughters. We got to teach our, our sons, our granddaughters, our grandsons. And I guess the last thing I'm going to say, also, um, I, I see how sometimes here people don't want to get bored. They always have something to do. There's always something entertaining, something to, to occupy yourself with. 
When was the last time you allow when was the last time you were bored? And when was the last time you allow yourself to be bored and enjoy being bored? I think in, in this rapid culture, being bored it's it's a magnificent gift. And I also invite you to next time you think you're gonna get bored, go for it. <laughs> Get even more bored because you also, at one, at, at, at one point, you're going to come the other side. So one of my most fantastic teachers in spirituality taught me how to get bored. And it's, a, it's an art. And, and I would spend hours with her, and, and I'd be like, I'm bored. She said, well, you're still not there, so a little bit more. So, so when you start meditating, when you go and meditate, and you f you're like, okay, I've been meditating for an hour, I'm bored, I'm going to go do something else. No, that's just the beginning of it. That's just the beginning of it. And then uh, you, you enter this place of the cosmic boom, and then one of, I, I, I see that Alberto says how not even light escapes from this darkness. Well, in a one moment or another, one of these sparkles of light is going to grab you, and you're going to be sped up the other side, full of light again, full of joy, full of happiness. So, thank you, everyone. Aho. This is great medicine, great teaching. <coughs> Diving into the darkness. and the, uh, Because that's where we find the the deep transformation, and otherwise, when spirit comes to bring us that gift, we're we're not ready. There's a wonderful story that we like to share about uh, Lala. Lala is, was a very wealthy merchant in India, and one day a traveling saint comes to his house, knocks on the door, and the servant receives him and welcomes him in, and. Uh, and Lala offers him room and board and every comfort in the house for days and days so the monk is able to rest. And the monk is so grateful that he says to Lala, Lala, I will give you enlightenment. I will take you to heaven with me right now. as just to thank you. And Lala says, you know, the business is just going good. My kids are beginning to run it. Come back in five years. I'll be ready in five years. The saint goes wandering again and travels and comes back five years later and knocks on the door. The servant recognizes him, and he says, where's Lala? The servant says, oh, Lala. Lala died of a heart attack a couple of years after you left, and he's, he's passed away. And he goes, I'm so sorry, but he says, welcome. You're welcome in this house anytime. And the saint looks in the corner, and there's a little dog, and he goes, Lala. What are you doing there? He says, well, you know, the children were growing and the grandchildren had been born and they needed somebody to protect the house, so I've come back to protect them. The saint says, well, I've come to take you to heaven. Are you ready? He says, you know, the grandchildren love me so much. <laughs> they love playing with me. Come back in five years. So the saint leaves five years later, knocks on the door again. And the servant is there, and he asks, where's Lala? He says, well, a year ago, these thieves tried to break into the house, and this brave little dog, that's about the dog, the brave little dog fought them, but they killed him. Oh, and the saint goes, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. And he looks in the back, and in a beautiful cage, there's a big parrot, and he goes, Lala, what are you doing he says, well, you know, the grandchildren miss me so much, and they had nobody to play with. He says, well, I come to take you to heaven. And you know what the parrot said. Lala said, come back in five years. So, of course, when our calling comes <laughs> to come to heaven, and it's not when we died. That's the inevitable calling. But it comes every moment in those sacred instances when, when synchronicity is at its most beautiful. We have to be ready to say yes. 
but the other side of the story is also beautiful because the other side of the story is that like Lala, we create heaven wherever we are. We create heaven on earth. And, the, um, and this is what 2012 is about. 2012 is about the return of the sacred feminine. It's about the parting of the veils between the worlds. It's about the inner world and the outer world becoming one as they, li as they were for so many thousands of years. So that the outer world, for most of us already, has lost this, this seductiveness that it once had, its reality, its tangibility. We know, like Bruce Lipton was saying the other day, it, it's all spirit. Somebody asked me during my workshop, well, are you saying that it's all a story? We're talking about trauma. I said, yeah, all of it is the story. <laughs> and we have to dream a better story into being. But that requires that we repair our brains. So I would very quickly want to take us, because we're running out of time, through repairing our brain. And it's the region in the brain that is damaged most readily by stress is the hippocampus. The hippocampus is, Candace was talking about it yesterday, is a memory processing way station. It's where we process information. And the hippocampus cannot tell the difference between something that happened 20 years ago and something that is going on today because it cannot tell time. So it superimposes the past on the present. I'm going to give you an example. Susan, is that your name? Would you mind sitting in the back? You're making me very nervous. She is identical to my high school girlfriend that dumped me the day of the senior prom. <laughs> and then went out with my best buddy. We were sitting on a table together. and They were making out next to me. They had braces on. They were getting stuck with each other. <laughs> God. Where did you go to school, Susan? I went to school in New York State. To high school. Algonquin Regional You're kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> Now, see, this, I'm joking, of course, but this is what happens, is that we keep bumping into Rosita. Are you sure your name is not? <laughs> we keep bumping into our past over and over again, and we keep missing the opportunities. And 2012 is fraught with opportunity. But if we miss it, if we can only see our past before us because our hippocampus has been damaged, we're going to miss what 2012 is about. So how do we repair the hippocampus and break out of the cyclic, destructive behaviors? Emotional trauma also damages the hippocampus, as well as high levels of stress. But today, we have discovered that you can grow new brain cells. When most of us went to school, the notion was that you could not grow brain cells, that every beer you had, there were 20,000 neurons you would never see again. Well, we know that that's not the case. We know that the brain produces stem cells. Did you know that? The brain produces stem cells. And that it actually produces a uh, brain-derived neurotropic factor that increases the complexity and the growth of neurons, BDNF. So how do we turn on the BDNF production? Brain-derived neurotropic factors that create new brain cells? Well, there are four ways, caloric restriction, fasting, exercise, and DHA. How many of you take your omega-3s? Got to take them every day because DHA is no longer, it's an essential fatty acid, which means we don't produce it. The brain is 40% DHA, and we don't get it from our food anymore from dietary sources because we used to get it from fish. And today, all of our fish is farm-raised and fed corn. So we are deprived of DHA. We're living and working with clients whose hippocampus has been damaged and who have no way of repairing it. Caloric restriction does the same thing. And I'm going to run through some of these slides. But you have caloric restriction in every tradition in India as Upavasa, Yom Kippur, Ramadan. Every sacred tradition has a tradition of fasting. 
And what happens when we fast is that we stop feeding the brain with sugars and we begin to feed them with fat, with ketones, which are 20 times as powerful a brain food as sugars. But they trigger the, produ the production of neural stem cells. And we begin to repair the hippocampus. You can repair the hippocampus in six weeks of a high DHA diet. And you know, when I was in the Amazon and studying with the shamans, I primarily learned the energy medicine practices. But they also had different practices during the vision quest where you had to eat certain plants and herbs. And they would say to me, Alberto, eat some of that bark every day. And I go, why should I? It tastes awful. <laughs> they, said, they said, eat it because that's the way it's always been done. I said, well, tell me the chemistry of it. He said, what chemistry? We've always eaten this horrible tasting bark. <laughs> so I ate it. And then 20 years later, we took this back to the laboratory with the co-author of my most recent book, David Perlmutter, MD, who's a neuroscientist. And we found that these plant substances repaired the hippocampus. All of them, all of the sacred foods and sacred plants. And look at what happens when you increase your DHA intake. Look at what happens with your risk for Alzheimer's. It goes down to by 85%, from one to four. High DHA intake, you take your brain with you for the rest of your life. Pretty incredible, but even more important is that we're able to take it into 2012 and beyond. And where do we get our DHA from? We get it from fish oils or microalgae. The other thing is that the, <coughs> the DHA, the fish oils, and your meditative, your stillness practices influence genetic pathways that prevent the diseases of aging. The Western medical model is that we have to treat, <coughs> is that we have to treat illness. We have to treat something that has gone wrong. The shamanic model says that nature selected for intelligence, not for brute force, not for brawn, but for intelligence. <coughs> and that at a certain point, our consciousness was going to be able to influence our genetic expression. So every cell in the body is programmed with a self-destruct or a death clock, a self-destruct mechanism. And the process is known as apoptosis, which is programmed cellular suicide or cell death. What the shamans discovered is that through your practices of consciousness, you could activate pathways, the FOXO pathway, the FOX, think of the FOX, awakening the FOX. FOXO activation increases the transcription factors that arrest cellular death and apoptosis. Consciousness practices and energy medicine practices are influencing your genetic expression. And what they're doing is that they are healing by preventing, by shutting down the death clock programmed in every cell. So I, this is a difficult concept to get because I asked one of the shamans one time, well, how do you deal with the illnesses of old age? How do you live a long life? and prevent the illnesses of old age. She said, the way you deal with the illnesses of old age is to avoid them altogether, is to live a long and healthy life. I said, well, come on. You know, I've got a PhD, I'm not stupid. How do you deal with the illnesses? The way to deal with them is to not have them, is to turn off that cellular death clock because consciousness, nature selects for intelligence. Because the agenda that we have, which is to live a long and healthy life, which is to have our health span be equal to our lifespan, is anti-evolutionary. Because nature selected us for reproduction, not for longevity. 
nature selected us for reproduction so that after you reproduce, you're no longer really biologically viable. <laughs> but all of us have a big investment in living a long and healthy life, right? So what we have to do here is to use the gifts of consciousness to basically reprogram our genetics, to grow new bodies that age and heal differently and die differently. And we have the ability to do that. In energy medicine, the medicine that you practice is the medicine of the future. It's not the violent medicine that uses chemotherapy to attack or antibiotics to kill. It's the medicine that says, you know, we have 10, 100 trillion cells in our body. We're a colony. And only 10% of those cells belong to you. Did you know that? <clears throat> the other 90% are the, the bugs and microorganisms that we have a symbiotic relationship with. Not parasitic, but symbiotic. You know the difference between them, right? Parasitic relationship is what your children have with you. <laughs> a symbiotic relationship is what you have with your partner, right? <laughs> so we are a colony. And, the, and this colony is maintained, the well-being of this colony, by the luminous energy field that surrounds and informs and envelops the physical body. And it's the feminine life force in this field that is able to restore health, that when we repair mitochondria, through our practices of stillness, of meditation, of prayer, of taking the supplements that repair mitochondria, we're awakening the sacred feminine, and we're installing health. We're no longer in the old paradigm of curing disease, but we're creating health. When you create health, disease disappears. Because in the West, we have this great, great tendency to categorize diseases and illnesses. We have over 14,000 different illnesses listed in our diagnostic books. We have many, many different kinds of illnesses and very few kinds of people. But most of those illnesses, most cancers, most heart disease, most hypertension, most dementia, what they all have in common is the breakdown of the feminine life force. Mitochondrial breakdown is responsible for all of these illnesses. We restore the sacred feminine. We commune with heaven and earth. We enter into sacred relationship with ourselves. We go in that journey that Marcella was talking about into the depths of the soul to, re to die to the old and birth the new. We awaken the feminine life force. We live long and healthy lives. Thank you very much, and walk in beauty. Thank you.